If you don't mind, I'd like to talk to you for a bit about medieval transport in this video, which has been sponsored by Audible, but I'll get on to that in a bit. Now, when I say medieval transport, actually much of what I'm going to uh, say could be applied to other periods as well, to the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, the Ancient Period, and further afield than the sources that I'm going to use, which are quite biased towards England. I will be talking uh, as well about uh, Europe. But you know, whether you're in South Africa or China, a road is a road, a wagon is a wagon, a horse is a horse. So uh, much of what I'm going to say will apply more widely. But I'm going to, I'm going to concentrate on medieval, medieval England. Now, the first thing I want to really stress is that rivers were enormously more important back then. Now, if you're watching this, you're probably some uh, city sophisticated urban type, and uh, you probably don't even know the name of all the tributaries that run into the river that flows through your city. Yes, yes, you thought I was going to say you probably didn't know the name of the... Well, you probably, yes, you probably do know the name of the river that flows through your city, but do you know the names of all the tributaries? And do you know how far up those tributaries you can sail, how far they are navigable before you have to get out of the boat? Aha! You probably don't. All right, some of you might do, but you're clever clogs. I'm not talking about those. Most of you don't. Um, now, we today, if we're going over land for a long distance, we'll pick, uh, do we go by rail or go by road? Those are the two uh, main options. Um, if you're in the USA, uh, most people in the USA these days use rail transport hardly ever. Um, but if you're in New York, say, um, maybe it's, it's, it's a better analogy if you think of it between the, the dense road network um, between the canyons of New York and the subway, which is a much less dense but still quite useful and viable transport network. So. In a place like medieval England, if you're going to go uh, on a, a longish journey, I'm not talking about one where you could walk there in under a day, I'm talking about long journeys, um, you think, well, should I go by boat or should I go by road? Now, rivers, Rivers are good. Rivers are really good. Now you get free energy. I mean, the flow of the, of the water takes you in one, one direction for free. Granted, you have to struggle against it in the other direction. But rivers are seldom, I mean, not talking about raging torrents here. These are wide, usually sluggish, navigable rivers. So uh, you, we're not worried about storms and waves and those sort of things. So yeah, you will have to row a bit or get the sails out to go upstream. But it's actually still a smooth and comfortable ride upstream. And you don't have to deal with hills. Oh, hills. If you're, uh, you're someone who is dealing with, with uh, carts and wagons, and you have to get over hills, they are the bane of your life. Uh, but rivers are really good at avoiding hills. It's, it's almost as though they just somehow know. So uh, rivers are great. Uh, they're free. God just put them there for no, uh, no cost at all. And uh, most of them uh, don't have to do much maintenance either. It's just the flow of the, the river just keeps it working somehow. It's just, it just all happens on automatic. So um, rivers are good. Good. And if you are blessed, and I mean really, really blessed to live in England, then you're never far from navigable water. Almost none of you are far from navigable water. You, almost all of you are not very far from the coast. If we look at a map of England and Wales, um, you can see these black dots around the edge. Well, those are all medieval ports that are at the mouths of navigable rivers. So as you can see, England and Wales is, is pretty well served for that sort of thing. So if you want to get from almost anywhere in England or Wales to almost anywhere else, you can just pop down the river. That's going the easy way to the sea. Then go around to uh, wherever it is. It's probably not far from the coast anyway. And bingo, you're done. So um, that's one great thing uh, about living in a place like uh, Britain, which is well served for, for waterways, but also you know, almost never uh, more than a day's walk from a major navigable river. So a day's walk is, let's say, 15 miles, day's journey. Uh, here's a map of England, and you can see the shaded areas are those few areas which are more than a day's walk from a navigable river. So you can see that in terms of land area, um, almost everyone, it looks as though they, they live quite close to a navigable river. But actually, even this is a distorted picture because, of course, uh, most people live in towns and cities where th that grow up along major navigable rivers. So, in fact, in terms of population, almost everybody lives near uh, within a day's walk. Uh, probably most people within substantially less than a day's walk of a major navigable river. So you have this uh, other network, a bit like the railway network, that's, that's out there and, and ready for use. And of course, people were using it all the time. If you look at a lot of old maps. You often see little pictures of rafts and boats along sections of the river, and you might go, oh, that's really cute. They used to decorate maps. Why don't they do that anymore? Well, it's actually, or sometimes it's decoration, but it's actually also conveying information. That little boat, that little raft says, this bit of the river is navigable. 
um, and what sort of boat is drawn as well might be granting you some information. Now, um, you might not, if you wanted to go somewhere like Derby, think of going there uh, by boat. Now, okay, yes, there are today enthusiasts with their narrow boats who might go put, 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 put very slowly and leisurely uh, around the canal system of, of, of Britain as it exists today. But for most of us, if you want to go to Derby, you don't, you're not going to think, oh, I think I'll go by boat. But in, in the medieval period, people went to places like Derby by boat. They went to Warwick and Shrewsbury. Uh, in 1333, I read an account of uh, people questioning whether a boat that had turned up in Shrewsbury had actually paid its customs for getting into the country. So it, this was a seagoing vessel that got to Shrewsbury. Um, the, the monks of Radcot, let's have a look where Radcot is. It's way to the west of London, but the monks of Radcot used to sell their uh, surplus crops to London, not to any of the, the, the locality um, uh, or anything along the way, along the Thames to, to London. No, they used to take it all the way to London. Why would they bother doing that? Well, presumably they get better prices in London, but it, there must have been Pretty, it must have been a pretty efficient uh, and easy journey to, for it to be worth them sending it all that way to London just to get a bit slightly better price rather than selling it more locally. Um, but they did. They, they sell they sold this stuff to London. And in fact, the, uh, the agriculture around London was able to specialise because there were so many rivers that flowed into London and so much uh, produce was being brought into London from far and wide that the farmers around London could specialise, not grow all the crops that London needed, but actually just grow the ones which grew best there and perhaps they got the best local prices for and other stuff could be brought in elsewhere. So if you've got a transport network that's so efficient that a large area of agricultural land uh, can specialise, then you've got clearly a, a, a well-functioning and efficient transport network. So it seems that these rivers were pretty flipping useful. Now, uh, oh, in 1254, uh, I read of um, 24 tonnes of wine. I'm going to have to explain what that means in a moment. Going from where, I'm going to have to explain that as well, where is spelt like this, okay? It's the name of a place. It's here, it's north of London. And they sent 24 tonnes of wine down to London. The same journey uh, in the 16th century was the object of complaint for, uh, by the carters, the people who, who operated carts for a living because, you know, this was eating into their livelihood. Why can't they send stuff, stuff over land? Well, the thing is that a ton, T-U-N, spelt like this, and yes, it is related to T-O-N, which is spelt like this, which is the, the unit of weight that we're all familiar with today. Um, but a, a ton, the reason we pronounce ton, ton, so it sounds a bit like ton, uh, even though it's spelt ton, uh, is that a ton was one of these. It was an extremely large barrel-like thing. The reason I don't say it's an extremely large barrel, because the word barrel actually refers to a particular size of vessel. Um, today we have a barrel of oil. It's the standard uh, unit that oil is, is sold in around the world. So there is a barrel of oil, a different vessel uh, that was made the same way out of curving planks of wood put together would be called a keg. That was smaller. And some of the large ones were called tons, T-U-N. You'll find this in a lot of pub names around. A lot of pubs called the three tons or something. Anyway, so 24 of those were sent in a boat. So it must have been a pretty big boat. Um, so it gives you some idea of the, uh, the, the trade going along the rivers of England in the medieval period. Now, uh, if you wanted to get from one place to another, what you could use, of course, is a map. But actually, people in the medieval period generally didn't use maps. Maps existed, um, but uh, most of them weren't, uh, as far as we know, the sort of handy pocket things that you might fold up and stick in your pocket made out of paper. Uh, no, maps tended to be put on uh, on vellum and uh, maps, well, we, we, the, the two most famous uh, maps of medieval England that were actually made in medieval England are the Goff map and the uh, Matthew Paris map. And they're made of vellum and they're about the size of a door, so not very handy pocket items. Um, uh, if you look at the Matthew Paris map, uh, he was a, a monk who did oh, various things, uh, and he created this map. And you can see straight away, massive emphasis is put on the rivers. Yes, there are roads, uh, a number, quite a few roads marked on this map, but look at the look at the rivers that he's he's drawing to our attention. So he clearly thinks that these are the the, the important highways of the realm. Um, and the Goff map is really difficult to see if you see the original. So here's um, Here's a, a, a black and white uh, rendering of just a little part of it. And you can see again, very heavy emphasis put on rivers. 
Um, and yes, there are some roads again, uh, joining towns and the like, but look at the rivers. And notice how each river ends in a little sort of like a, like a circular bit, like a full stop. Um, I don't know, I'm conjecturing here, but to me that looks like uh, sort of the end of the navigable bit uh, is, is there. Um, so um, the, uh, the river, yes, uh, that, that's, so there you go, I've made my first point, though the rivers uh, were extremely, um, uh, a Goff, by the way, was just the name of one of the, the, the owners, so don't, don't look up um, some monk or whatever called Goff, uh, Goff. Uh, that was, it, became, it came up for auction and never mind. Uh, so uh, next thing, next thing is how big were these boats then? Um, I've just said that some of them must have been quite big. All right, but how big? Some of them were seagoing. Well, um, unfortunately, the boats themselves don't survive, nor sufficient records uh, for us to, to make very accurate estimates. But we can infer things from various clues, one being um, the, the fees and taxes charged to boats coming into various cities. So, for instance, in 1377 in York, uh, we know that if you brought in... 10 or fewer tons of cargo in a boat, you had to pay a halfpenny. That's half a penny, written half D. And I've decided not to tell you why it's a D. You can, you can look it up. Um, I, you know, I like to leave a certain amount of mystery. Anyway, if you uh, brought in uh, 10 to 20 tons, uh, then it was a penny. And uh, 20 tons and up, it was uh, two pence, or tuppence, as they would have said. So. Can we infer much from this? I think we can. Let us imagine that there are reasonable, sane people charging reasonable rates uh, and that this bore some resemblance to the reality of the boats coming into the town and that they were trying to maximise income whilst not inconveniencing people too much. So you might imagine that there were quite a few boats under 10 tonnes where you just look at the boat, oh, that's easily under 10 tonnes, don't have to measure anything, that's a hate me, thank you very much, goodbye, off you go. Um, and that 10 to 20 was a reasonably common size of boat, I would have thought. So you might say they thought of a medium-sized boat as between carrying 10 and 20 tonnes of cargo. Uh, and above 20, they just thought, ah, oh, it's quite big, and presumably there weren't that many um, boats and ships bigger than that coming in. And besides, you know, is it, if it's, imagine if it were 39 tonnes, and he's arguing, oh yeah, it's 39 tonnes, but you're saying, oh, I think it might be 41, and if you had a break point at 40 tonnes, uh, how are you going to? How much work it would be to find out if they had 39 tons rather than 41 tons? So just uh, 20 tons and up. There you go. That'll be tuppence. And we do know that there were some very big ships. We do know that there were 50 tonners in various inland towns in Britain. And we know this because in times of war, the king would send out word, send me all your 50 tonners. So uh, word would be sent to York and all the ships of 50 tons from York would be summoned to go round the coast and down to meet the king's fleet down somewhere like Portsmouth. Um, now, these people weren't stupid. I can't imagine that the people of York ever looked at, he wants 50 tonners? <laughs> you couldn't get anything beyond 25 tonnes up our river. Nah, nah, the, the, the guy's mad. Um, now the River Ouse, uh, as it goes through uh, York, it's about, as the, as, the, as the crow flies, it's about 36 miles inland. Well, there must have been uh, a, a reasonable number of 50 tonners in York for the king to send word. He would have known. People People have travelled to York. People would have known how big the ports were at York and known something about where ships were. So when they sent word to York, send us your 50 tonners, I think it's pretty reasonable to conclude there would have been some 50 tonners uh, in York and loads of other towns, uh, places like Ipswich, wouldn't surprise you too much. Ipswich is quite close to the coast. And don't forget that the coast used to be um, uh, further to the west than it is now in places like East Anglia. <clears throat> A lot of land has been reclaimed. Uh, but you, Maidstone, for instance, was another town that, that was uh, required to send its 50 tonners. Well, that's, that's a fair way inland today. So there were some 50 ton ships going to these places. So there you go. So you have some idea. I can't tell you how many under 10 tons in ratio to 10 to 20 tons, but it gives you, a, I think, a reasonable feel for the, the range of, of ships. Um, now, I said that you don't use uh, maps to get from A to B. Instead, they would use something called an itinerary. An itinerary is just a list. And a list you could carry uh, written on something in your pocket quite easily. It's just a list of places. Well, you're here, then you need to get to there, then you need to get to there. Oh, yeah. And it's just a list of places. Now, and, and we have some of these itineraries. For instance, the Titchfield Abbey, 
uh, we have the Titchfield Abbey itineraries, which are quite handy. And someone went to the trouble of just looking at them all, plotting as, as dots the, uh, the various uh, stages of the journey uh, on, on a map and then joining them with straight lines. And what you get is this. And you can see that without the aid of a map, these medieval people were able to give each other pretty good advice. Uh, a list of those points to visit uh, takes you in a pretty efficient route from Titchfield Abbey to all these various places. Um, so itineraries worked, they were convenient, and don't forget that there would always be people about. You're only travelling um, not many miles every day, and so you get to a town, maybe there are no signposts, but there'll always be someone to ask, and you say, well, the next place I need to get to is, is here on my itinerary. And someone might say, oh, actually, normally I would say go by that road, but uh, this time of year it's probably flooded, uh, in which case I'd say take that road and then turn right when you see something or other. So you could get local advice on the best way to the next node, um, and then on you would go. So itineraries were, were very efficient. Um, and uh, now, um, rafts. I'm going to talk about rafts next. So we know that they used rafts, and we know that the rafts were in use for, for a very long time. The ancient Celts used rafts, the Romans used rafts uh, to move things, things about, and we know, don't we, that the Romans were capable of making really, really big, impressive things. They made huge floating pleasure palaces for their emperors, so they could easily build a really big raft if that's what they wanted to do. Um, and but we don't really know how big they got. Uh, I'm sorry, none of them survived. You wouldn't expect them to survive. That sort of thing doesn't last very long. A lot of rafts might have been a, a, a one-way thing. So you build a raft, you load it up with stuff, float it down the river, and then um, you can break it up uh, to sell it as timber, use it as firewood, whatever. You don't bother trying to get it back upstream again. Um, so it's one way of, of transporting a load of timber and all the stuff that you want. Build a really big raft. Now, some rafts on some big rivers got really big. Uh, now, you may say that uh, Britain has got some pretty big impressive rivers, but actually the rest of the world has bigger, more impressive rivers. You know, we don't have anything to rival the Mississippi or the Congo or the Amazon. And in Europe they've got things like the Rhine and the Danube, which are you know, big, impressive and very long rivers. And on these rivers, by the time you get to, the, say, the 18th century, and when we got the evidence, because people started talking about them and drawing pictures of them, we get to see just how big these rafts got. And how big were they back in, in the medieval times? I don't know. But if we look at the ones that are around in the 18th century, there were rafts that were 330 yards long and 55 yards wide. Look, here's a picture of one. Here. You see, it's huge! These things had crews of up to 500 men. They had buildings on them with fireplaces. They had offices. They had slaughterhouses on them. Um, and they had up to seven-man oars. You would heave on these to get it round the corners as you, as you uh, floated down the river. Uh, here are some pictures also of uh, a model I found in a museum in, in Dusseldorf. Uh, I know they're not the greatest pictures. I was trying to click um, through the, the glass cabinet that was around it. It never works very well. But anyway, it gives you some idea. And how much could these carry? I don't know. I don't know. But I don't think anyone actually knows. I think everyone would just have to make estimates. But a hell of a lot, I think, is a reasonable, a reasonable estimate. A hell of, actually, by the time you get to the 18th century, there probably are records, but I don't know. Anyway, but a lot. And maybe these two are often one-way uh, tickets. Uh, there were, we know, boats, for instance, there were boats called Lauatanas. Uh, here's a Lauatana. Here's a model of one. Here's a not very good picture of one. Um, now you may think there's something a bit odd about this boat. It doesn't, it doesn't look like a proper boat, does it? It doesn't have, doesn't have the proper sort of curving hull. and It hasn't got a proper prow on it. It's just got that sort of flat front. And uh, Well, I mean, you, know, you wouldn't want to go to sea in it, but it's probably reasonably uh, worthy for going down a, a, a big, wide, sluggish river like the Rhine. And yeah, these are one-way boats. So if you wanted to get from A to B, sometimes what you would do is you would build a, a boat like that, um, out of planks and then you would load it up with loads of stuff and then, then you would go uh, along the river and then you would offload your stuff, sell it, drag your boat up onto the shore, break it up and sell it for timber. And of course if all the planks are straight that's much more useful timber to sell isn't it? So you probably get a better, better price for your wood. Um, of course you've then got a problem haven't you? You've just come one way so how do you get back? Well uh, possibly um, a lot of people would just wanted to go one way and had no uh, need to get back straight away. So it was something to do if you had a one-way journey to do. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll put a boat together and uh, put a cargo together. And by the time I get there, uh, I'll have got there every bit as fast if I just uh, use transport alone. And uh, I can make a bit of money for myself while I'm at it. 
Um, and then perhaps if you do need to get back, I suppose you could always sign on to crew on a, a boat or ship going the other way, or you could perhaps spend the money on a, a wagon and, and load that up with stuff and then go back the other way and sell the wagon and, and a cycle, perhaps. I'm conjecturing now. But anyway, there were one way, there were one way boats uh, as well as rafts. Um, uh, now, you might think then that with all this uh, wonderful Rhine and, and, and Elba and Danube and all these big European rivers, uh, the, the economy might have been super booming in places like that. But there were problems. Uh, one of the problems is that uh, Europe has had an awful lot of tiny little kingdoms all the way along these rivers, and they're often uh, rivals to each other. Um, and they were very jealous of the various rights and privileges that they had. Um, so if uh, someone is taking a load of stuff down past your city, you might say, oh, oh wait a minute there, sunshine, let's have a look at what's on your boat. OK, uh, don't want that. Uh, ooh, that's nice. I think you should sell that here. Uh, where's that going? Oh, to our enemies that way, our rivals that way. I don't think they should get that. No, I think you should sell that here. You do want to carry on from here, right? You don't want us to impound you. Oh, you will. Oh, you will sell it. Oh, good. Um, so that sort of thing went happen, uh, went on, which you can imagine wasn't tremendously good for trade. Also, they would tax the trade along the river because it was a very easy way to make lots of uh, money. But unfortunately, they would tax it so punitively that a lot of people were driven to overland much less uh, efficient transport uh, for that reason. Although if you wanted to move a really big load of stuff, you still had to use the river because you can't get all that much in a wagon. Um, so um, oh, another thing which held back these cities as well is that because they had all these established rights that I, I talked about, um, if a new city sprang up, it, it wouldn't have all those rights of trade along the river. So even if it was on the river, because it didn't have the rights to fully exploit the trade on the river, uh, it couldn't really develop. So there were, there were a lot of new cities springing up and not really thriving as they should have done uh, because there wasn't, a, there wasn't a proper free trade happening along the river. So there you go. Um, limitation of, of being European. But uh, now I've said enough. I shall talk about my sponsor. Audible. Yes, I think that time has come. Now, Audible, in case you don't know, is the provider of uh, perhaps, you know, the, well, it claims to be, and I think with some justification, the top provider of English language uh, spoken word audio in the world. Um, and they have a huge online library of things that you can take advantage of uh, by uh, becoming a member and paying a monthly subscription. Now, I've been advertising Audible for a few years now, and the offer has been just getting better and better and better. Uh, it's still you pay some money every month and you get some stuff. But what you get for that money seems to be getting better and better. And now um, not only do you get one audiobook a month for your membership, um, but you also get access to the whole of the Audible Plus catalogue, which is huge. It has all sorts of stuff. And forget, we're not just talking about novels here. We're talking also about oh, uh, language uh, tuition and self-help books and other stuff. And on Audible, in, on the Audible Plus catalogue, which you get unlimited uh, access to with membership, uh, there are also podcasts and uh, dramatizations and Audible originals, which are things that they produce themselves using some, some pretty stellar casts. Um, so what you get for your money, uh, it seems to be getting better and better. And if you are in the USA, which is about a third of you, um, right now uh, you can take advantage of an offer. Uh, you can get six months, yes, six months introductory uh, membership for just $4.95 a month. And you might say, oh yeah, but they, they, they always suck you in with this introductory offer. And then before you know it, you blink and it's hiked up to some huge. No, it goes up to $7.95. That's still not that much, really. Um, cheaper than it used to be. So, um, uh, that's available, and unfortunately, only to people in America. But still, if you want to find out all the goodies that you can get in whatever territory you occupy, you can go to www.audible.com uh, stroke Lindy Beige and find out what's there. Or if you like a, a second method, you could text Lindy Beige to 500 500. Or if you want, if you, if you want yet a third method, you could do the much easier thing and click the link. Click the link in the description. Um, now, looking about the, uh, the Audible site recently, my eye fell upon, yes, Consider Fleabass. Consider Fleabass is by Ian M. Banks. Uh, he was actually the same author as Ian Banks, but uh, he used those, those two slightly different names. Ian Banks for his, if you like, serious modern day novels, and Ian M. Banks for his sci-fi. And this was Consider Fleabass, which is the first of his sci-fi novels I read. And 
yeah, it's it's a proper sci-fi romp. I think he gets the balance just right. There's enough interesting world building there, stuff about uh, different species, different cultures. Um, it's not the hardest of hard science fiction, but it's not it's not pulp fiction rubbish either. Um, but on the other hand, it's a good space opera. It's got spaceships, it's got aliens, it's got laser guns, it's got freebooting buccaneering mercenaries and adventure and a big war and villainous villains and heroic heroes and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, it, I think it, it, it opens with a pretty nasty torture scene. But anyway, uh, brace yourself for adventure uh, with Consider Fleabass. Uh, but a word of warning, I definitely wouldn't get the bridge. There are a few of others which I don't like. The bridge, um, I was reading it, I slogged my way through the bridge and I was thinking, oh, this is, this is, uh, it reminds me of Alistair Gray's Lanark. And I got to the very end of it, thank goodness it eventually ended, and I found out that it actually had been largely inspired by Lanark. If I'd known that, I'd never have started. So there you go, word of warning, um, maybe not the bridge. But yeah, consider Fleabass and many of his other uh, novels as well. Uh, great. So if you start with that one, I think you, know, you may well get a, a taste uh, a taste for them and, and you, you may find yourself dis disappearing quite a, down quite a rabbit hole of Ian M. Banks novels. Uh, and Ian Banks novels. Um, okay, right. So www.audible.com stroke Lindy Beige. Lindy Beige 500 500. Click link in the description. Enough! Now, I think I should get on and talk about the arch rival to river transport, which was, of course, road transport. If you had just a short distance to go, you could just walk there, of course. Uh, but assuming you had quite a long journey, then you're probably going to ride. And uh, you might think, but surely not everyone could afford to ride, not everyone could afford a horse. Well, actually, near enough, they sort of could. And now today, not everyone has a car, but if you really want or need a car, even if you're quite poor, you probably can, if you live in a country like Britain, afford one. Uh, yes, of course, rich people can show off and spend vast, unnecessary sums on McLarens and Aston Martins and Rolls Royces, uh, but uh, other people who are fairly well-to-do can spend a bit more sensible uh, sums on Jaguars and Rovers and so forth, and they get to get some, if you like, uh, practical uh, utility from the extra money that they spend. They get to greater comfort and perhaps a, a little bit more power and a little bit more speed and get there a little bit earlier, but otherwise it's, yeah, essentially it's a car that gets you from A to B, and a lot of people who can afford only just, you know, a very ordinary Mondeo or whatever, they're fine too. Um, and the poor people, they can have a clapped out old banger that uh, is not brilliantly reliable and not brilliantly comfortable or fast, but you know, it gets you there. And well, horses were a bit like that. So there were horses for the super rich, amazing destriers and the like, and then there were clapped out old nags uh, for the poor folk. But most of the time they got you there. So you could just ride. Uh, of course, if it rains, you're likely to get wet. So uh, take a good cloak. Um, in the medieval period, women didn't ride side saddle. That technique hadn't uh, uh, arrived yet, but they did have uh, special riding skirts uh, to uh, preserve modesty and uh, make it more comfortable. Um, so uh, both sexes could uh, just ride a horse. Now, uh, there were other things on, on, the, uh, on the roads, of course. There were, I should talk a bit about uh, carts and wagons and coaches and carriages. Uh, they're the main ones. There were some other things on the road, uh, litters, for instance, but litters were not brilliantly comfortable. They certainly weren't common. They're really only for uh, moving heavily pregnant women and, and wounded men and so forth. And you wouldn't really want to go very far on a litter. It's no. Anyway, uh, so let's stick to the, the, these four biggies. Uh, so a carriage. A carriage is for moving people, but it's not really something of the medieval world. Uh, when you've seen those historical dramas in which she says, oh, Mr. Darcy, um, your Rococo house is quite, you know, forget about that. That's, you know, that's far in the future. That Those things are set in the Regency period or whatever. Um, and uh, those uh, open top carriages, they're very beautiful with the leaf springs and the lovely suspension and, and so forth, tr trotting very beautifully along the, 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 the paths to the country house. Yeah, that's, that's in the future. So those carriages really aren't medieval things, but they did have coaches. But a coach uh, is a bit like a mobile palace in this period. They have a roof and inside comfy seats and there's, there's velvet and curtains and oh, the bird cages and all the luxury. Yeah, it's a palace on wheels, but they were they were, I talked a bit before about Rolls Royces, people showing off. Coaches <laughs> showing off on a different scale. Coaches are the equivalent of a super yacht. Okay, something like this. You know, if someone owns that, they're just saying, I am richer than you could even imagine. Well, that's what a coach was like in the medieval period. And to give you some idea of just how common they were, 
In 1300, as far as we know, there were about 10 of them in England. Yeah, they were that rare. So they were, they were for the super rich. And it's not just the cost of the coach. Actually, that's not even the main cost, but the, the upkeep and maintenance, the repairs, the constant repairs you'd have to make to something like that, and all the people for crewing it, and all the horses you'd need for pulling it, and, and all the outriders to go ahead to arrange stabling, and all the guards you would need, because you're obviously super wealthy and there might be bandits around. The, uh, all the associated costs of running a coach uh, is, is just a way of saying I'm, um, I'm essentially a duke. And uh, I, I said duke there, but um, it wasn't even a macho way to go about. If you were a proper man, and this would include kings who were supposed to you know, wear armour and lead armies in battle and, and, and show the world that they're still healthy and up to the job, well, if you were a king, you wouldn't want to go around on a coach. That's for old folk and women. You'd want to be riding like a proper man. So. Yeah, coaches are for moving people and um, uh, not very many people, the super rich. So that leaves carts and wagons. Um, now a cart has two wheels. That's what distinguishes it from a wagon. And usually you have in front of a cart a something cart. Now, as far as I know, um, most carts, when they were first made, brand new, they were just a cart of some sort. But then you would sell it to someone who would then uh, shovel a load of dung into that cart. And from that day forth, it would be a dung cart because no one wants to put anything in a dung cart other than dung once it's been a dung cart. And similarly you, you shovel coal into a cart and it becomes a coal cart. And yes you could give it a really thorough clean perhaps, but people are still not going to want to put their nice fleeces and linen uh, in it because you know they're always going to end up with those little black gritty bits in them. So uh, yeah, a coal cart is forevermore probably a coal cart, dung cart, hay cart, etc. And they are for carting stuff about. They didn't have seats in, they weren't for transporting you, they were for transporting stuff. Uh, now a wagon also didn't have rows of seats. Again, it wasn't for transporting people, it was for transporting stuff. If you want to transport a person, stick him on a horse. Um, and a, uh, a wagon, uh, therefore, is the, uh, it's actually the principal long distance road haulage thing. It's the equivalent of the lorry. So, um, yeah. Next thing people want to know is, so you talked about how much cargo the boats could carry, how much cargo could a wagon carry? It's an excellent question to which there is no simple answer. I will eventually, I will get to a reasonably simple answer. I'm going to come up with a figure after a bit, but first, before I give you the figure, I want to, uh, to uh, get you to understand the complexity of, of the question. So, um, how much can a horse pull? Well, depends on how big the horse is, it depends what the ground's like, and depends how far you want it pulled. Now, a horse could pull, oh, um, uh, I don't know, 8,000 pounds, 12,000 pounds, like that, if it's a good, strong horse, for a very, very short distance. But you're going to very rapidly uh, exhaust a horse doing that. If you want a horse to pull um, something like a wagon for many hours a day on a long journey and then not be utterly exhausted by that so they'll be able to carry on the next day, uh, then, well, yeah, okay, maybe a horse could pull, let's say, twice its weight at a, at a steady walking pace for eight hours a day, something like that, on a, on a, on a, on a flat road. Okay, uh, but if you're on a paved road, um, then you might go be able to pull, you might be able to pull three times its weight. Okay, so now you're going to say, all right, but how heavy is a horse? Ah, that's a massive variable as well. So, um, a tiny little Shetland pony might weigh 200 pounds. Uh, a riding horse might, for a lady might be 800 pounds. Maybe for a guy, 1,000 pounds. A cart horse might be 2,000 pounds or more. Um, so horses are very variable. But if you want a horse to pull something, not fast, but something heavy and steadily, then a really big horse, a cart horse, um, is the way to, is to, go, to, to do it. So now we humans, we're very efficient we adult humans at walking. What we do is we fall forwards and put a foot in the way and we then, we don't stop, we continue falling forwards. We fall forwards and continue falling forwards, putting foot in the way and again and again and again. And by this method, we're able, using the stiffness of our bones and our body weight, to transport ourselves across the ground using actually not very much muscle power. If you want to know what inefficient walking looks like, just look at a toddler. They go run, 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 and listen to a toddler. If you've got a toddler living above you, particularly if they don't have carpets, you know about it because toddlers uh, walk really inefficiently, bam, 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 using lots of uh, muscle power. 
And if you try to take a, a toddler for a long walk, you'll find it's exhausted very quickly. Um, so uh, if you uh, have a big cart horse, it will do the same thing. It will just let its massive horsey body fall forwards and then just put a fairly uh, stiff leg in front of it and walk along the ground quite efficiently, pulling your massive cart along. Trouble is, though, a big cart horse eats an awful lot of fodder. So you might have uh, some horses, maybe two, four, six. Medieval carts went out to about eight horses. Um, and a rough equivalent, by the way, six mules is roughly the equivalent of four horses in terms of pulling power. Um, so uh, but let's go back to horses. So um, you've got an equation to work out. You want to get from A to B. How many horses shall we use? How much uh, stuff should we put in the, in, in the wagon? Well, we want to uh, carry something really heavy. Oh, OK, so we'll need a very substantial wagon. Ah, there's a trouble there, because then in order to build the wagon strong enough to, to hold the really heavy load, we'll have to build the wagon really strong, which means that the wagon will also be really heavy. So we'll then need really heavy horses to pull it. And really heavy horses need a lot of fodder, which of course we'll have to put uh, in the wagon. Okay, so if you got the equation spectacularly wrong, uh, you could put so many such enormous horses uh, on the task that the wagon is entirely filled with fodder, and by the time you get to your destination you arrive with nothing which is pretty flipping useless. Now you may say, but once you're halfway there, uh, the wagon is half empty. Uh, well, yeah, great, but you're also a long way away from the thing that you wanted to move. Uh, and you've still got to move the horses. What do we do, to set them free? No. Okay, so you could go spectacularly wrong. Um, but let's just try to come up with some sort of middling figure. So if you had, say, uh, four horses pulling a wagon, uh, you might have maybe a third of what's in the wagon might be fodder for the horses on a fairly long distance journey. Uh, and the wagon itself might weigh 1,000, 1,200 pounds. Uh, and you might be pulling a total load of 4,000 pounds. Yeah, I'm gonna come up with a figure. Okay, here comes the figure, a ton and a half. Okay, so a reasonable wagon load is something like a ton and a half. But it might be a ton. Do you remember I said that a horse can pull uh, twice its weight on a, on a dirt track, but maybe three times its weight on a, on a, a good road? Well, that was assuming it's flat, but, that's the trouble with road transport. There are these things called hills. And when you get to a hill, a well-paved hill on a nicely um, bewheeled wagon, then those wheels want to roll backwards down the hill. And the horse is trying to grip on the well-paved road with its with its hooves and scraping. And, and oh dear, it's now all gravity and everything is acting against you. Um, so what you might do is work out some plan of action. Someone might know the road. He might know his horses, the load, and he might say, okay, well, the thing to do on this particular journey is, right, four horses in front of the wagon, two horses walking behind. We get to the really steep bit after a couple of days, but the ones that haven't been pulling anything, they'll still be relatively fresh. Okay, we take the two tiredest horses off and we offload half of what was in the wagon, put it next to the road, pay someone to look, it up, look after it. Then we hook up the, the two fresh horses, take half the load over the hill, unload that uh, and the, 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 the two tire the horses. Then uh, two horses bring just the empty wagon back over the hill. Uh, then we hook everything that's left up back and off we go and maybe that'll work. So you might end up on some journeys coming up with a solution like that. So you always, you need someone who knows the road, knows his horses, knows, knows his job to come up and try to come up with the, the, the balance of the equation that works best. Uh, so can you see that there is no, how much can a horse pull? How much, how big is a wagon? There's no simple answer to that. Um, now, um, this means that you can come up with some very rough calculations uh, with armies. So for instance, here's, here's a good rule of thumb. Uh, a good rule of thumb is that one man consumes one ton of food and drink a year. And that's actually pretty accurate. So one man, one ton of food and drink per year. OK, so if you've got an army of, say, 10,000 men, which is a large but not unfeasibly large army for the time, uh, then uh, you're on campaign. How long do you want to, uh, how, many provision, how much provisions do you want to carry? Uh, enough for a month, say? You're probably going to be on campaign for more than a month, but maybe you could, I don't know, capture a town and already, go with a month. Isn't that's a reasonable amount of stuff to be carrying? OK, so you've got a month's provisions. Uh, for an army of 10,000 men, that works out at one ton a man, one and a half tons per wagon, 555 wagons. 
555 wagons to supply one month's uh, food and drink for 10,000 men. So that's one wagon per 18 soldiers. And that's before tents, ammunition, um, mobile field forges and, and uh, hospitals and all the other stuff that's not soldiers that you're, you're taking with you. So this goes a long way towards explaining why you'd quite like your soldiers to walk along or ride along in their armour, thank you, because you don't want to have to transport the armour as well, because it's another load of wagons and all those horses, which then have to be fed. Uh, and some of them are going lame, so you need horse doctors. Ah, logistical problems must have been, uh, yes, a constant headache just as they are today, to be honest. Um, so, there you go. Um, a, a handy calculation which some of you may find useful in your, your historical um, ramblings. It, some of you are writing novels, some of you are writing war game rules. I know that in, some of you are into that sort of thing. So, um, how far would you get? So, a wagon might go, say, 12 miles a day. That's, that's a reasonable distance for a wagon to go. Uh, if you're just riding, of course, you could go further. If you're on good roads and you've got really good kit and maybe, say, you're the king, uh, that always helps. Uh, uh, roads tended to be in good repair wherever the king went, because if he found that the road wasn't in good repair when he travelled over it, he might be issuing uh, writs to various, to various people, stiffly worded, and they'd better get that road fixed double quick. Um, so the king, travelling with his court, so for instance, Edward I, um, in, when he was travelling in January, uh, he was going at um, 19 miles a day, and that was when he was 60 years old, and he was, he was managing to move himself, he was on a horse, and his entire court, and that's would of course, you know, there would have been some wagons I'm sure in that, uh, in, in that convoy, um, at 19 miles a day, so that was actually a pretty, pretty good lick. Uh, but it was possible, of course, to go a lot fur uh, faster. So, for instance, a very youthful Edward III, uh, he rode to, um, uh, to York and he was going 55 miles a day. This is a younger, fitter man on a good horse, on a well-paved road, 55 miles a day. That's, that's pretty good going. Um, typically, though, when you're walking along, you'd be going plodding along at maybe something like three miles per hour. You might be going for eight hours a day tops. And to go 15 miles a day on a horse, that would be quite commonplace. If you pushed it, you might get 20 miles um, in winter. In summer, 30 miles. So there's, th there you go. So in summer, you get about um, uh, three seconds, three, three over two, as far as you get in, in winter. That's a, a rough rule of thumb. Um, but the record, uh, we, well, I should say, the record for England in the 14th century was uh, a messenger galloping along, um, delivering a message about the death of Edward I, and he did 80 miles a day. Um, uh, but he was uh, a king's messenger. He would have been a young, fit, solitary, uh, good rider on presumably a decent horse, and um, he probably could... Uh, ride that horse much harder than you would normally ride your own horse that you'd be worried about uh, and at the end of the day perhaps uh, he would uh, get a new horse for the next day and uh, say well there you go that horse has been exhausted but I'm requisitioning this one in the name of the king you know and uh, then he carried on. Uh, I thought I would just look up uh, what sort of distances that the Pony Express uh, was managing and the Pony Express uh, when it was um, delivering messages across uh, uh, the, the, what was to become the USA uh, well, was the USA, sorry, this was the 18, 1860, 1861, uh, was, it was the years of the Pony Express, didn't last very long. It was very heavily subsidised and still went bankrupt, so it shows you it wasn't actually a viable service. But um, they were going much further, and they were really riding those horses, they were galloping on those things, but they were only going about 15 miles, so they were actually only doing short journeys. The message that the guy was carrying was going uh, at, uh, at stupendous speeds, much more than 80 miles a day, um, uh, but uh, the, the, ride, the horses were only going 15 miles, and then quite often at the next station they would not just swap horses, they would often also swap riders, um, so it's not really a fair comparison. But yes, the Pony Express went faster, but it didn't actually in the long term work. Uh, anyway, um, all right, I've said enough about all that. I'm going to go on to a more general theme now about how much do people travel anyway. Now today, of course, we travel much more than they did in the medieval period, but this idea that the medieval mind was incredibly shuttered and blinkered and the world ended at the boundary of his parish uh, is ridiculous and just doesn't, doesn't stand scrutiny. Whenever the king went to war, he would summon men from all around 
kindle the kingdom and he would summon arrows to be made by by fletchers all around the kingdom they would all have to be transported so every time there was a war um men from right up in the north would go all the way down to ports right down in the south and they would encounter all the various different um, towns and dialects and strange foods and, and strange ways that the other folk have and they would then mix with all those different folk and then they would go off abroad and you know shoot some Frenchmen and then after a bit they would come back and they would tell everyone and of course there were merchants from all those many ports that I, I showed you on the map earlier traveling far and wide and coming back with all sorts of tales and there were people going on crusades and very long pilgrimages and so forth there were lots of travel people um, so a medieval person would know where Lithuania was uh, roughly and have some idea about how far Lithuania or Turkey was yeah they didn't know about China obviously they didn't know about um, the Americas at all or southern Africa but um, out as far as uh, Eastern Europe and uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, yeah, they, they knew roughly what these distances were. And because they would talk to lots of people who had been there, almost everyone would know someone who was decently well-traveled. And there was a merchant class, of course, using the rivers that, uh, and, and roads that I've talked about before, going uh, hither and thither. And at some point, almost everyone would have some reason to travel a long way. It might be for a marriage, it might be an inheritance. Every time um, if, if your father died and, and passed on a deed to you, you might have to go to the local capital or, or sometimes you might have to go to the, the national capital, to London, uh, to, to sort it out in the records office and the deeds will be transferred to you and so forth. So that was a, a reason for a long distance journey and sometimes you might have to go a long way to a court for a court case. There were, uh, though there were also traveling courts, um, so almost everyone would have a reason at some point in his life to, to go on a fairly long journey. Um, so yes, yeah, so the idea that um, everyone was just stuck in their own tiny little mental bubble um, is really, really not true. Um, now, uh, King Henry III, who reigned for 56 years, by the way, which I think you would agree is a pretty good innings for a medieval king, for any king. Um, he was a pretty well-traveled guy within his, uh, his realm. And I found a map uh, which shows uh, the various journeys. Now, this obviously isn't everywhere he went. Uh, this is just during his reign. Uh, and these are places we know for certain he definitely went. And as you can see, he traveled around quite a lot. Um, uh, notice he didn't go to Devon or Cornwall. Do you know, not a single 14th century monarch in Britain ever went to Devon or Cornwall. It was just, just, yeah, just this dark, mysterious southwestern peninsula that uh, it seems they didn't bother with. So I imagine things were quite different down there. Uh, anyway, uh, this map here shows all the journeys uh, that he did at least three times. And some of them he did an awful lot of times. He went to Windsor 180 times during his reign. So that was uh, that was quite a common trip. So uh, yeah, he must have spent a long time on the road. I, I really hope he did like riding. Um, but people did, I think, generally like riding because it, it, it's an enjoyable thing. That's one of the reasons people did riding is they actually quite liked it. Um, and uh, one reason you wouldn't want to go in a, a wagon is that you're stuck on this bumpy wagon, wagon on a bumpy road. Uh, the suspension on the horse is a bit better. Um, and the off-road capability of a horse is terrific. You can, you can go anywhere you like. You can go door to door. You can ride right up to things and, you, oh, look over there. Let's go across that field. And wherever you want to go, you just go there. You're on a horse, but on a wagon? No, you've got to stick to the roads. And if there's some, you know, a tree comes down, what do you do? Spend two days building a ramp? Uh, you're a bit stuck. Um, so yeah, people liked uh, the, the, the freedom and the, the, the view that they got from the top of a horse. So the wind in their hair. Although actually when you were traveling you'd almost always wear a hat if you're a respectable a person. Right, anyway, sorry, I had a bit of a tangent. Um, uh, so uh, roads, I'll talk about roads. Now about 40% of medieval roads in, this, by the time you get to about the 14th century, about 40% of roads in England are actually still Roman roads, or at least along the line of a Roman road, or at least along roughly the line of a Roman road, because they did, they did shift them about a bit and put the occasional, um, <clears throat> not always convenient uh, alteration in. And a lot of the Roman stone would have been robbed for building other buildings nearby. Uh, but, but you know, Broadly speaking, it was once a Roman road. But the idea that there are just these few big Roman roads and that was it uh, is, is nonsense. The density of roads then was greater than it is today. Today we've got the motorways, the A roads in, in England and the B roads. And we think, well, we've got a pretty impressive dense network of metalled roads. And yes, given that they're metalled, that's true. But 
In the medieval world, it wasn't just every village and every town that would be linked to every other by roads, plural, but also every farm, uh, every workshop in the countryside, every abbey, every all those rural buildings were all linked. And on a farm, you need to harvest all the stuff in that field over there. Ah, well, you'll need to be able to get a wagon there. Ah, you don't have a tractor, though, with those enormous big modern tyres that can take you across mud really easily. Uh, yeah, you're probably going to need, you might not call it a road. I mean, at one point, there comes a point where is it a road or is it now just a track or a path or whatever. But there were roads which became tracks, which became paths, which went to every field of every, of, of every farm. So the, the road, the density of road network was actually considerably greater then than it is now. In terms of actually proper roads, I do remember once hearing that, that the, it, the peak was 1810. 1810 was the, uh, the peak of proper roads density of the network in Britain. Um, so there. Uh, right, so um, yes, they weren't always in the best of conditions though. Uh, if the king wasn't going along them and the local lords or whoever was responsible for them uh, you know, were a little bit lax, people could be quite lazy and do things like, think, oh, well, there's a very convenient place to get a load of clay. So let's dig up a load of clay and so you'd have these, these puddles uh, which were actually eight feet deep in the road sometimes. We have uh, accounts of those, even people drowning. I read of one where, actually, this isn't funny. I laughed, but sorry, I take back that laugh because a man drowned and the local bishop claimed all the man's goods because the man died on his lands. Yeah, bishops were great in those days. Anyway, um, the uh, I'm going to talk now about the, the problems with river transport. I've talked a little bit about the problems of road transport and I, perhaps I've been, uh, I, I, I was really quite complimentary about how great river transport was earlier, but it was also plagued with problems. Um, now there is some controversy here because how navigable the rivers were and when, it, no one really knows. And there are some people arguing one way, some people arguing the others, uh, but it, it's a fairly civilized uh, controversy. Um, the thing is that, what is the evidence? The evidence is principally court cases. You see, we have in uh, England amazingly good court records. Some of them go back to the year 600 or so, uh, going back to, we've got loads that go back as far as Richard I. Um, so we've got this amazing, often unbroken um, record of, of, of uh, court cases. And a lot of court cases show that people were di disputing stuff on rivers. But is it proof that the river was navigable or is it evidence even that the river wasn't navigable? Because if there's a court case where a lot of people complaining that this bit of, uh, of, of river is not navigable, is that because it wasn't navigable or was it because it was normally navigable but some git had rendered it unnavigable um, and the, the, this was the problem? And so actually is it demonstrating the, the, the norm being navigable? Huh. We, we, and, and here lies the controversy and I don't want to, uh, to, to uh, align myself uh, entirely with one side or the other. I'm sure there's some compromise here. Uh, but we do know that there were loads of disputes. Uh, in 1268, the Derwent, for instance, uh, got blocked and uh, the men of Derby were, were complaining about this, uh, as you might imagine. But on the other hand, in the 15th century, the, uh, the people of Warwick uh, were told, Oi, you know, uh, make the, the Avon around you navigable. Uh, properly again, thank you very much. And the men of Warwick said, nah, and didn't do it. Um, and there are loads of cases of people who'd been given quite substantial amounts of money in order to, in order to maintain the river and keep it navigable or make it navigable, but to, uh, just embezzled the money and just not. So how much, meanwhile, is the river being used at that point? Not at all, or a bit, but not as much as it could have been. We don't know. There are all sorts of court cases with people putting, oh, uh, they're, they're building weirs uh, in the river. They're stretching fishnets across the river and cables across the river and ferries across the river and um, cr creating mill ponds or uh, mills themselves. Of course, w there are loads of things powered by water wheels. Um, it wasn't just mills, actually. There were water wheel powered trip hammers and things for making felt and, and uh, processing wool and which is also, I suppose, uh, process, making felt is a form of processing wool. But you know, you know what I meant, washing wool and 
and the like. Um, so there were a number of uh, industrial processes powered by water wheel and it wasn't just uh, that uh, the, the water wheel would stick into the river a bit, sometimes people would divert the river into a, a narrower bit to get a, a really strong flow to power the water wheel a bit better, but you couldn't get a, you couldn't get a boat through that. And sometimes uh, the mill was actually in the river. Uh, here's, a, here's a model of the sort of thing I mean. You see, it's a boat. It looks a bit like a paddle steamer, doesn't it? But instead of a steam engine powering uh, and turning the wheels, which then power the whole boat forwards, instead the boat is moored in the river and goes nowhere. That stays stationary and the current turns the wheels and drives the mill that grinds the corn, which is great. Unless you're in a big boat and you're trying to go upstream, so you're using oars and they make you much wider still and you can't get past. And, oh, I get that flipping mill out of the way. Sorry, mate. Middle of, a, middle of a grind, you'll have to wait. You can imagine the disputes. And there were many legal disputes. Um, I was quite amused to see that uh, one of the uh, uh, results of one of these court cases wasn't that the people were um, required to destroy the thing that they had set up that was blocking the river. Instead, it just became legal for other people <laughs> to destroy it. You, you could, you, other people were allowed to destroy it with impunity. Um, which is a, a, an odd, they, they don't, they don't uh, pass that uh, sort of sentence, uh, that, 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 that resolution in, in modern courts. Um, anyway, between 1302 and 1377, there were no fewer than nine commissions, uh, government commissions, just for the Upper Thames, looking at trying to keep it navigable, uh, or, or is that make it properly navigable? Again, how navigable it was, we can't really tell from these, these legal cases alone. Um, and there were all sorts of things. I talked about nets, mills, rafts, cables. Um, there were also other things where I've seen uh, in, in, in old documents things called uh, kettles and hex. I'd love to be able to tell you what kettles and hex are. I have no idea, but it seems that in the medieval period people put kettles and hex in rivers and it really, it really wound some other people up. Um, and um, so when you see a map like this, um, and someone says, this is a map of the navigable rivers in medieval England. And uh, I, I have seen such maps uh, described as such. Don't! Don't assume that this is a map of the navigable rivers in, in England, because it, it really isn't. For one thing, it's not very detailed. If we zoom in on some little bit of it, this is, this is uh, the southwest peninsula, this is Devon and Cornwall, and you can see loads more detail. It wasn't on the big map. Let's go back to the big, big map again. Um, this this is not a snapshot in time. This is the opposite. This is like a really long exposure. These are rivers who, that, all, that were at some point navigable uh, during the medieval period, probably. But if we uh, look in more detail again, here's another map showing Yorkshire. I don't know how clear this will be, but I will twiddle the graphics to, in, in, in an attempt to make it clear that you can see that there are certain little bits where we're not really sure if that bit was really navigable or not. And some people say it was are going one way and some people say no it wasn't but you can see that it's a complicated situation and it's constantly changing over time so for instance when the bursar of durham um, made his uh, yearly uh, journeys down to uh, the boston fair to buy loads of cloth he would then have to get that cloth back to durham so how did he do that then well uh, we happen to know his route uh, this is from 1299 to uh, 1316 and uh, he would take the boat upstream he would go to Lincoln, then he would transfer onto land, and then he would go to uh, Torxey, and then he would get back in some boats, and he would go up to York, through York, and keep going further north until eventually the river would become unnavigable, then he'd transfer back to land for the last bit of journey up to Durham. And this he did then. Now, some people might be saying, hang on, I live in Lincoln, or I live in Torxey, why didn't he take the Foss Dyke, the famous Foss Dyke, the oldest canal in England? Uh, it was built by the Romans, you know. Well, actually, we don't know that it was built by the Romans. Um, some Roman stuff was found in it, uh, but uh, that's not proof on its own. Maybe someone dug a pit later and oh, I don't know what all this stuff is. I don't know either. Let's just dump it in the canal. I, yeah, no one will know. A little fully archaeologist which perhaps it did. But anyway, uh, it's certainly a very old canal where you have a literary reference to its uh, being opened or reopened, it's not completely clear, in 1129 in the time of uh, Henry I. So uh, it, was certainly, it was certainly old, and it would have been old even um, in, in the, 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 the Bursa of Durham's time. So why didn't he go along that bit then? 
presumably because it wasn't navigable. Um, and yet we have another journey uh, for him recorded, and this is in 1336, and he went the other way entirely. He went out to sea uh, and then turned left, went up the coast to Newcastle, turned left again, went inland, turned left again, got out and then did the last uh, 15 miles going south to Durham overland. So uh, what had changed in the meantime? Had, had the rivers become unnavigable or just was it just more expensive or did he just fancy seeing the coast or we have to guess there's so much conjecture but in that interim period uh, this was in 1319 in 1319 the king uh, Edward II he uh, invited the scholars of King's Hall Cambridge to come and visit him in York for Christmas which was rather nice and so they went now if there was just one obvious way to do it You'd think that they would all do it then by the obvious way. But in fact, we know that two different groups of scholars set off and one went entirely overland up to York and the other one went up this river, then up a sorry, down the river, then up its tributary and then onto the next river and then repeat left, right, left, right, left, right, up several rivers. And then they went overland for a bit uh, and they got to uh, Lincoln. And here's the funny thing. They got to Lincoln uh, uh, over land, that little last bit of the journey, then they got, no, sorry, no, they, right, sorry, no, they arrived in Lincoln in a big boat, having earlier been done a bit of uh, overland travel, they got into a big boat, went to Lincoln, then they transferred into two small boats and carried on to Torxey. Uh, so it seems that you could go by boat between Lincoln and Torxey along the Foss Dyke then. Okay, so we know they went along the Foss Dyke, but what does that mean? Is it that only small boats could go along and is it that uh, the big boat uh, or is it the big boat you know, sorry this is where I stopped lads he got as far as Lincoln and said oh, I'm sorry this is where I'm going it's a big city this is where I'm uh, I'm trading with I'll be turning back from here you'll have to find something else from here and that's why they got into two small boats or was it that the big boat couldn't do the next bit of the journey because it was only navigable to small boats again we have to conjecture um, Sorry not to be able to tell you something more definite, but on the other hand, you know, this sort of puzzle is interesting in its way also, isn't it? I hope it is. Um, anyway, uh, so... I didn't say anything about cargoes, did I? Right, uh, I'm just going to finish up now by talking about cargoes. Now, you may think that uh, the, the, uh, the bulk of what was moved around would have been agricultural produce. Uh, well, the biggest single category of thing moved around was indeed agricultural produce. Uh, this doesn't, by the way, include livestock. Livestock you would actually move on its legs, it's the best way to move it, uh, but it would include perhaps um, uh, meat, slaughtered, uh, slaughtered animals. Anyway, so agricultural products all added together was only about 25% of what was being uh, transported at the time, long distances. Um, uh, the next uh, biggest uh, category is wool. Uh, and then after that, it's wine. Yes, wine. Perhaps you wouldn't have guessed that, but it was wine. Then fish. Then it was timber. Then stone. And then uh, lead. By the time you get down to lead, that's only 5%. And then uh, beyond lead, it's lots and lots of things that were responsible for a tiny percentage of what was being transported. So those are the big ones. And you might find it a little bit odd that more wine and fish are being transported than timber and stone. Uh, and here I'm conjecturing, but I think with good reason, that yes, timber and stone, you need an awful lot of that, loads of demand for it, and it's big, heavy stuff, so you would think that's bulk transport stuff. But also, timber and stone is very widely available. Almost everywhere in England would have the local forest for timber and some quarry, not all that far. So actually, uh, wine, the good stuff, is not being made everywhere. So the good stuff from wherever it was being produced, yeah, you'd want that uh, transported quite a long way. And fish, people at way more fish in medieval England than people eat today. Way more. And, and yes, you could salt it and you could smoke it and so you could preserve it, but also people wanted fresh fish and it wasn't, don't forget these were all Catholics, and it wasn't uh, just Friday that these Catholics ate fish. You, you'd have to eat fish at least twice a week, and most, well, most people did. And they also just liked fish more. Uh, and um, uh, if you've caught a load of fish possibly along uh, the river or uh, in a lake, but also in the sea, you can, if you get in that ship and get it inland, you can still uh, get it to a, a, a city inland and sell it before it's gone off and get a decent price for it. Uh, so fish, lots of fish, mmm, fish. Whew. Right, I think that's enough for now. Bye.